Will you please stand for the prayer of illumination and the reading of God's word? The NIV translation of this passage in Matthew uh, says, Be careful. But in the King James, it says, take heed, or the Greek says, take warning. This is a warning message to have your heart right with God in whatever we do, to have our heart right with him. So let us come first to God in prayer. Lord, help our hearts to be right as we have come to listen to your word. We pray that you would... Speak to us by your Holy Spirit through the scriptures and in this worship service and draw us closer to you because we have been here today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let us read the word of God together from Matthew 6, 1 through 4 and hear the word as we read it. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give it to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> There's a lot of talk these days about fake news on the left, on the right, and in between. And it's hard to know who to trust. But I remember growing up watching uh, CBS and NBC, and then when Dan Rather resigned in 2004 because of a a story that was proved to be false, um, I I, I was heartbroken about that. And then when Brian Williams, that I I really liked on TV, uh, had to resign because of another story about some um, saying that that he was under fire in a helicopter when he was not, that, that just took away my trust, but today there seem to be so many people in news media and politics who just make things up to make themselves look good. And, you know, if it happens in the news media and politics, it filters down to all of us. None of us are immune from making up fake things to make ourselves look good, pretense, It used to be that uh, those kind of stories were limited to the Globe or the National Enquirer, stories like the Lizard Man in Bishopville or um, Bigfoot sightings or UFO sightings in Washington, D.C. or something like that. But now it seems to be everywhere. Truth is harder to find these days. And it's part of the philosophy that has infiltrated our culture, the uh, 25-cent word named postmodernism. Postmodernism philosophy is basically the idea that you do your thing, I do my thing, and we'll just all get along together. And when tolerance is the main value, one of the casualties of that value is it doesn't matter. Truth is a casualty. But being a person of honesty and integrity and love and truth and having your heart right with God is one of the main things that Jesus taught us and it's something we all can learn. And in our passage, he talks about doing your acts of righteousness not for pretense or for show. The the actual Greek word in there when it says to be seen by men is the word theatron from which we get our word theater from. It means to wear a mask, to pretend to be something that you are not. And Jesus warns about having your heart right more than having your actions right on the outside. Let me read the message translation of our passage. I think it even makes this very, uh, even more clear. Be especially careful when you're trying to be good 
so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. And when you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meetings and street corners like a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all that they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it. Quiet and unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. That's the message translation of those verses we just read. And they just so clearly remind us the world is needs us to be true to ourselves and to our God and to our hearts. Jesus talks here about giving to the needy, and he assumes that we will give to the needy. He doesn't say why we should. These are the ten reasons you should give to the needy. He doesn't say um, you should give to the needy in, in a particular way. He just says don't make a big deal of it. Just give to the needy. He assumes that being a Christian means helping others out when they are in need. Um, in the Greek and Roman pagan world, that was not the case. We assume it was the case of everybody back then. But in the pagan world, you gave to public building projects if you were rich, but you really didn't give to your faith, and, and you really didn't give to the needy, except for maybe to your family or something like that. But in the pagan world, it was unheard of just to help the poor out of generosity. Christians are supposed to be a generous people who give of ourselves and sacrifice of ourselves because Jesus Christ sacrificed for us. One of the things you'll hear about in this missions month is the, is the growing needs of our area and the growing needy population of our area. As our population has grown, as our church has grown, so has the needy of our area. South Carolina has grown by one million people since the year 2000. A million people. That's a 25% growth rate since the year 2000. Just four years ago when we started our snack pack ministry, which is helping kids who, who don't have food get food on the weekend when they're not in school, we started that with just 11 kids being referred to us by the guidance counselors. Now it's between 45 and 52 kids per week. We Care, when four or five years ago, We Care was open one half day a week on Mondays, and then it stretched to Wednesdays, then it stretched to Fridays. And um, it, it, four or five years ago, We Care was giving out 150,000 pounds of food each week. Now We Care, uh, each year, now We Care gives out 250,000 pounds of food each year. So a two-third increase in the giving of food. And it's not because we have so much food to give away. It's because the needs in our area have grown. Jesus said to give to the needy, and we need to be careful that we do just that. And then he says to give without acting. The world is not a stage, despite what Shakespeare may have said. The world is not a stage to play out your good works. The main thing is to give from your heart and to give to those who are in need. When the, Romans, uh, when the Roman politicians gave food to the needy, they would blow a horn, and the poor would come, and all, come to the horn, and they would give out bread to the needy, those who were in need. And Jesus said, don't blow your horn when you give to the needy, just give silently and secretively. Uh, we have an expression today in our society about this, don't toot your own horn. That comes from this passage. It means don't brag about being good. Do it for the glory of God. Let that be the way that you give. Um, Ananias and Sapphira pretended to give to the church, but they really did not. And they were rebuked for it very visibly. They were punished for it. And they were said to be lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, you can lie to everybody else, and you can fool everybody else. You can even fool yourself, but you can't fool God. So give your heart to him. 
and everything else will become real and right. Um, one time, Robert Redford was uh, in a hotel lobby. Some of you don't know who Robert Redford is. He's a famous actor. Uh, Robert Redford's in a hotel lobby, and uh, somebody recognized him, and they came up to him, and they said, are you the real Robert Redford? And he said, only when I'm alone. <laughs> Who are you? You are the real person when you are alone with God. And all the pretense and the masks are wiped away. Let your heart be right. And the way you give of yourself be right before him. You know, uh, the Reformation really started because people were giving in fake, false, selfish ways, and the Pope encouraged it at the time. Uh, Things have changed in the Catholic Church a lot today, but at the time, they were trying to build this beautiful church, St. Peter's in Rome. Beautiful church, if you've ever seen it. And uh, they didn't have enough money, so the Pope authorized the selling of indulgences. That is, if you pay certain money to the church... uh, your sins could be forgiven, and perhaps the sins of your dead ancestors or friends could be forgiven as well. Now, the thing that's wrong with that is only the wealthy could have their sins forgiven. And and there was this monk that came into Martin Luther's town banging a drum and blowing a trumpet and blowing a flute, calling attention, and it just goes straight against this passage. And so Luther said, no, it's all about the heart, having your heart right with God, being justified by faith, not by your exterior works. And that's true for us today. And as we come to God for communion today, and communion is a way that we renew our faith, I invite you not to come with any false motive, but to get your heart right with God when you take the bread and you take the cup today. Make it a thing of your heart and determine to give of yourself, not because you have a lot or to make the church budget or to, I don't know, make somebody impressed, but give of your heart to God. And if you give your heart to God, everything else falls in place in your life and the life of the church and the life of the community. So uh, I invite you again, as Jesus said, to get your heart right with him because he gave his heart to us. And that's what communion is about. His sacrifice for you and me. His greatest gift on our behalf on the cross. Lent is about remembering that, about having humility, because he was humbled and he gave himself. Amen.